All right, Michaela Peterson, well, I guess it's fuller now. What does a day of eating look like for you? Let's jump right into that. Day of eating, so strip loin in the morning, strip loin at lunch, and really strip loin at dinner. I basically just eat three strip loins a day. Anything else? Sometimes I'll have soup, and the soup is literally, it's either like strip loin or something leaner, pressure cooked with salt. It's like the easiest diet ever. It's the easiest diet ever, especially if you have an air fryer. So when did you adopt that method? Strip loins probably for the last year. Before that, it was basically lamb three times a day for two years. And then before that, it was ribeyes for two years. Okay. So your predominant <laughs> focus is like ruminant meats. Like that's- It's just ruminant meat, yeah. Okay, is there a reason for ruminant meat specifically? Yeah, so I had all these autoimmune issues and I don't seem to tolerate anything other than ruminant meat. So I've tried chicken, I've tried wild fish. I can kind of do wild fish. I can kind of do the like soy free, really organic chicken, kind of, but nothing makes me feel as good as like fatty ruminant meat. So, so just what I tolerate. Interesting. So when you're eating, say a strip, are you devouring the fat as well? Or you do you have days Everything. where you, yeah, just like completely. Everything. Yeah, I won't eat like all the gristle. So, but I eat almost everything on the plate with a ton of salt. What about any kind of like ground beef, ground meat, anything like that? Do you ever? I, so I had a period of time where I ate bison for a long time because I've got a histamine intolerance. I don't know if your audience is going to be familiar with histamine That's intolerance. It's big right now. A lot of people are talking about it. I just did some content surrounding it because it's huge. Oh, it was a nightmare. And I think we figured out it was because I was living in a place that had mold in it and my stomach was just a mess. And I think that was contributing to the histamine intolerance. But for the years that I had lamb, I ate lamb and bison. That was because of histamine intolerance because I despise lamb. <laughs> like I despise it. It was one of my least favorite foods before I started dieting. And then I ate it for two years because it was the only thing I could stomach. I put a link down below for a probiotic that I would recommend. I've talked about it before, so it's no surprise. It's called Seed, but that is a special 25% off discount link if you want to try them out. I don't typically like probiotics. I like this one because they're different and they put their money where their mouth is. As I've stated before, it's got a capsule inside of a capsule. I highly, highly recommend if you're on the fence, you just try it because it's something that you will feel within a couple of days. Focusing on your gut health could be a priority for you. And if it is a priority, it could start changing how you feel. Okay, so starting with a microbiome shift by adding this into your diet, adding the good probiotic, adding the fiber in. So that link down below gets you 25% off. You will likely feel a difference within two or three days. It's that powerful. So again, top line of the description underneath this video for 25% off. Interesting. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what, avocados, tomatoes, like these histamine, high, high histamine foods. People yeah. don't even realize that it trickles beyond just GI issues. Uh, like yeah. I'm, it's, uh, I don't know if you, have you tried taking, I know you're not a big fan of supplements in a lot of cases, but like the straight DAO enzyme. I, I take DAO. Yeah. So this, yeah, that's the other thing I added in in the last year. And I was pretty against supplements because most of them make me feel worse. Even the vitamins like make me feel worse. I'll get insomnia or mostly it impacts my mood. So I just didn't take anything. I don't take organ supplements, like nothing. DAO has helped so much with histamine intolerance. So I do take DAO before I eat now. That's been happening for the last year. That's been a, that's a really, really big one. I feel like, I feel like there's a lot more that's going to be coming out surrounding histamine because I feel like it's one of those things where there's histamine, there's histamine sort of incubators, things that like kind of release histamine mm -hmm. when you eat them that you're basically sending your body kind of into overdrive. And then there's just a lack of being able to metabolize it. So it's like, there's a triple threat that comes in when you consume something that has histamine or you're sensitive to histamine. Mm -hmm. um, or your DAO levels are low, exactly. like all of it. Yeah, yeah. I had all of it. Just so, everything was low and well, DAO has been, DAO has been great. Yeah. So that's the only supplement really I take other than electrolytes. I'll take electrolytes too. Gotcha. So if we back up and take a look at sort of your whole diet, what would you say five things if we had to kind of, eh, we can go with whatever number, but let's say five things that you've noticed by switching to sort of that lion diet sort of diet, whether it's the bison, whether it's the lamb, whether it's the strip, whatever you're doing, but whatever from soup to nuts, starting from when you were eating regular foods and where did you transition? Like what were you eating before? Because you've tried a lot of things. I know you tried keto, you tried this and that, and then you ended up settling on sort of this, I don't want to call it an extreme version of carnivore because I wouldn't consider it extreme by any stretch of imagination, but it is a different form I of carnivore. I consider it extreme. I well, think it's extreme. Yeah, but we think extreme is cool. So I think extreme. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, five things that changed. So I was very depressed. Um, I started on a paleo diet and it was a very, very restrictive paleo diet. Like I wasn't eating nuts. I wasn't eating eggs. I wasn't eating dairy. Uh, so it was kind of, and I was in ketosis. So it was a keto diet, but without the dairy and eggs that most people eat. Uh, and that worked for a while. Like I, that worked really well for a while. And then when I had my first kid, so this was six years ago, it stopped working and a bunch of my autoimmune symptoms came back which was heartbreaking because I'd stopped all my medications and I'd gone into remission and then suddenly my symptoms started creeping back and it was really scary. And that's when I started cutting out more foods because first I realized, oh, sweet potatoes, I feel worse when I'm eating sweet potatoes. So then I was like, okay, I'll get rid of some of the carbier things I was eating, which like sweet potatoes aren't that carby, but mm -hmm. I got rid of those, I felt a little better. And so when I eventually went to just eating ruminant meat, I went from eating salad, which was like lettuce, olive oil, apple cider vinegar, like simple salad to just eating meat. And just from that transition, my depression, severe depression, like crying every morning, being depressed, that lifted in about six weeks. I didn't feel good in six weeks. I just stopped crying in the morning and was like, that's better. Five months into it, my anxiety went away. So I had severe anxiety. That went away five months in. Oh, and then five months in is when I really felt like profound changes. I went from really feeling like I was stuck in my head and like in a version of hell to feeling like I was in heaven, like five months into the diet. So a lot of the reason that I'm doing this is for mood. Um, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and bipolar at one point and it was severe. So most of what I'm doing is for mood, but I also had arthritis, so my joint pain went away. Let's see, is there anything else? And then I guess energy levels, obviously. Yeah. I had chronic fatigue syndrome as well, but that actually lifted with a paleo diet before I went to just eating meat. So some of my symptoms went away with a paleo diet, but the psych symptoms really lifted with an all meat diet. Do you feel like it was more the elimination of things or perhaps micronutrition that you weren't getting before from say the ruminant cuts of meat? I think it was the elimination of things yeah. because I was reacting, like I react to minute amounts of things I introduce with major inflammatory responses. That'll include joint pain, my skin will break out, my stomach will be a mess, and the brain fog is just terrible. And so I, I do think it was from eliminating things. And I get a lot of people who are like, well, if you just cut processed foods, and just cut sugar, then you'd experience the same thing. But I had already done that and it wasn't working. So I was reacting to things like olive oil and lettuce. I don't think that's normal for people. And I do think that like I'm yet to get to exactly what's wrong with me. All I know is the diet has been working. It's been six years now and it keeps me in remission. And you have no issue as far as needing fiber, I mean, you have no issue GI related. Everything seems to be copacetic there. Huh? Everything's been good there until it gets a bit more complicated. Like I moved to Miami and uh, we ended up having mold in our HVACs and didn't realize it. It was like a beautiful new house. And then I started having GI issues and my skin started breaking out. And I immediately was like, it's salt. Like I didn't ex think it's the air I'm breathing. I thought it's something in my diet. Like, why can't I tolerate these things? I cut out salt for a while. It wasn't the salt. It was the air I was breathing. And that's when I started taking DAO and my histamine intolerance got really bad. So like I was eating lamb at that point and then I was having trouble with lamb. I was like, what's going on? And it turned out it was my air. So now that we've moved and fixed that problem, I took a binder for a while to like detox from mold. That's significantly better. So I don't know if that answers your question. But it does, it does. Because it's interesting with histamine, you kind of work in the same mast cells, those mast immune cells, they, so they work on a similar axis where mold would react as well. So yeah. for example, um, like if you look at uh, like modafinil, obviously the, the uh, limitless drug, right? One of the common side effects with modafinil that is talked about is if you have a histamine sensitivity, then modafinil is not really doable. Oh, interesting. And when you dig deeper into that, you see the contraindications are typically cats, mold, and food with histamines. I'm like, hmm. So they're all seeming to work along a similar axis. I'm not an immunologist, but I'm smart enough to realize that, okay, if we're working like the mast cells that are ultimately at the very root of this entire situation with histamines. So some can speculate that when there's a mold issue, 
that can kickstart a histamine issue even worse or rear its ugly head, right? So it's like sometimes it's never a uh, one single thing. It's just them stacking on top of each other, working on a similar axis. Mm -hmm. That so, makes sense. So you sort of coined the phrase the lion diet. Now, why is it called lion diet? <laughs> what's what's the idea behind that? So I had a lot of people reaching out to me that were that had similar autoimmune disorders and were very, very like chronically sick people who'd been through the medical system, tried a number of things and they'd gone on the carnivore diet and they said, oh, it's not working. Like, why is it working for you and it's not working for me? And when I looked at their diet, they were eating a lot of eggs and dairy and eggs and dairy were one of the most inflammatory things for me. Like grains, especially gluten containing grains were terrible. Soy was terrible. Um, dairy was really hard on me and eggs were really hard on me. So the reason I named it the lion diet <laughs> um, I think partly it was so hard for me to restrict my diet down to that and it was so isolating and I got made fun of so much that I was like, okay, I want some strong name for this for people who have autoimmune disorders and need to restrict their diet and are being ostracized by their family. And so like, let's try to make it cooler. I don't know if I succeeded with calling it the lion diet. But so that was part of the reason. And then the other reason was to differentiate it from the carnivore diet because the carnivore diet includes dairy and eggs and those were very inflammatory for me. And I don't think that that diet works very well for autoimmunity or severe psychiatric disorders because of the dairy and eggs. That's what it looks like. I agree. I think the carnivore diet has its place for a lot of people by giving them a a bucket and a sort of a, a silo and just a, a some confinement. But if you actually look down at what's happening, some of the things don't add up. Like if you look at autoimmune paleo, for example, there's no dairy, there's no this. It never yeah. made sense to me why carnivore, and I feel like five, six years ago when carnivore was being talked about a lot in the early stages, like when, when keto was a lot bigger, people were more interested in that, carnivore was much more similar to what you're doing now. And I feel like as we've gotten into this quote unquote animal based yeah. and the lines have started to get blurred and I have no problem with animal based. I feel like for a lot of people that maybe don't have autoimmune issues, it's a perfect way to live, but the lines are getting blurred. So people are now thinking carnivore, you're kind of defeating a lot of the purpose because I think one of the reasons people feel really good on carnivore is because the presence of ketones, because the absence of some of these inflammatory mm -hmm. things and the histamines. But then when you start adding in dairy, not that I have an issue with dairy, but especially when you're adding in things like raw milk, which is delicious, I love it, but that's a lot of carbohydrates to a point where you're not really producing ketones. So you're sitting in, I've always called it metabolic purgatory, where you're like not quite producing ketones yet, but you're also not having enough carbs to thrive there. So you're just kind of like, eh. Um, so I feel like metabolically, people might struggle and would do better if they just said, hey, I'm just gonna like choose one path and stick with it. Yeah, and w when I did, so the paleo diet, I hadn't heard of autoimmune paleo at the time. This was 2015 when I like came up with this restrictive diet. I wasn't even really familiar with paleo or keto or any of those terms. But what, what I did was almost identical to the autoimmune paleo diet. Like it was more restrictive, but that's what initially worked for my autoimmune symptoms. And it, it was eliminating dairy. I feel like people just like dairy. Dairy was one of the hardest things for me to get rid of. Like I cried when I cut out cheese. I cut out cheese for a month and I tried to reintroduce it and I had this horrible inflammatory reaction with like, my joints were in such terrible shape. My arthritis came back, my skin broke out. I think I developed a lactose intolerance in a month after cutting it. And I used to eat a lot of dairy and I, I like, I wept the next day. It was like, cheese is gone, cheese is dead to me. So I feel like people just like it. And I know a lot of people who've gone on the carnivore diet and they're like, oh, I'm not losing weight. Why am I, like everyone loses weight on this diet. Why am I not losing weight? I'm like, how much cheese are you eating? Like, oh, like that's like what I eat. It's like, okay, that's probably why you're not losing weight. I think people forget that at the end of the day, like cheese is still processed. Yeah. And it's still easy to overeat a ton of cheese. You know, it's, I have, again, I don't have a problem with cheese. I eat cheese, but I mean, you're obviously in a different I love category cheese. than I am with what you, what you can eat, right? But it's still possible to overeat and to not lose weight doing carnivore when that is a staple, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you still have to remember. I think what's nice about what you're eating is even if you're eating the entire ribbon of fat, even if you're consuming every last bit, it would be very, very hard to end up in a ridiculous surplus. Mm -hmm. Like it's very I'm hard. sure it's possible. I'm sure people have done it. I know Mark Bell has talked about how he's, he's like, I've gotten fat on steak before. And knowing, it's how, hard, knowing how Mark can eat, I can believe that. But <laughs> most people, 
man, I mean, if you put even the juiciest, fattiest ribeye, it's just, it's pretty hard. Yeah. 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 You've got enough, you know, well-rounded lean protein that's there as well. That's kind of superseding what you're getting from the fat. I would say you're probably, have you ever counted how many grams of fat? I mean, you probably don't even pay attention to that, but have you ever counted roughly how many grams of fat you're taking in? No. I know that at the beginning of the diet, so when I was like quite ill and went onto it, and that's when I was eating ribeyes, I was actually adding extra tallow to my ribeyes because I was hungry for it. And I think that's because I had, I think I had some neurological damage from being on psych meds. I was on psych meds from like age 12 to 23 on a really high dose of like two psych meds. And healing from that was hard. And I've noticed that with people who get on the lion diet, like if they're on psych meds, it takes longer for them to feel better because they have to recover from that. And people usually eat higher fat. So for about two years, I ate really high fat. It was like 80% of my calories were from fat. Now that I've switched to New York strips, I also eat jerky as a snack. I love jerky. Um, it's lower. It's probably more like 70% yeah. as opposed to 80, but I haven't calculated grams. Yeah, yeah I don't think the, I mean, it's all relative. It doesn't really matter. So it's interesting because uh, your your dad adopted some of this diet for a little while too, or is he still doing? He's still on it. Yeah. He's kind of on it out of necessity. Like my mom's very gung. My mom's on it too. She's very gung ho about it, but she had tried like going gluten free and she was a vegetarian for a while trying to figure out her gut issues. And so she's all for it. My dad kind of hates it, but it's resolved so many of his symptoms. He's kind of in the same place as me where he can't introduce things without feeling bad. Yeah. So yeah, he's still on it. He's been on it since February, 2018. My mom's been on it since January, 2018. And I've been on it since December, 2017. And he's doing the same kind of thing that he's doing the strips or is he just doing like any kind he of red strips? Meat? Yeah. And he's been eating strips for, well, I guess six years now. Yeah. Wow. So, so for him specifically, was he just kind of managing pain? What was, what was his reason for jumping on it? He had the same kind of psych problems as me. So he was on psych meds mm -hmm. for a long time. He was very depressed. It, that seemed to like, that seemed to run in our family. So the belief I had when I grew up was we have this severe depression that hits some people in the family. My great grandpa had it. My grandpa has it. My dad had it and I had it. And it was like, okay, luck of the draw. You just have a predisposition to this and you're like low in serotonin and you're, you're going to have this forever. And so that obviously wasn't true. It was food reactions from inflammatory reactions for whatever reason. Um, but he used it mostly for that, but also he used it for weight loss. Cause he, I think he lost 40 pounds on the diet. Uh, he had psoriasis, he had GERD and he had gum disease. So he had some autoimmune components as well. He had peripheral uveitis as well. And that all cleared up. And it's, uh, and I, I, forgive me for not knowing this. I mean, you're, you're both of you guys, you and your dad, and I, your mom too. I mean, you guys are very hard opposed to alcohol, I'm assuming, right? No. No? I mean, my parents don't drink. I drink sometimes though. This is also what like people poke holes in this diet because they're like, you drink vodka sometimes. Yeah. I drink vodka sometimes. It's also triple distilled or quadruple distilled. I know. Well, it doesn't so like, that it, it's distilled from grain. Um, and I have celiac disease, but I don't respond to it because it's distilled and it doesn't give me any autoimmune symptoms. Now the hangover that comes along with zero carb and alcohol is catastrophic compared to when you eat carbs. But I'm like, like I said, I'm on this diet out of necessity to keep my autoimmune symptoms under control and like my psych problems under control and they are under control. And vodka doesn't seem to trigger that. It doesn't make me feel good. It's not yeah. a healthy thing to do, but well, it's clear. I mean, you're not doing this diet to be part of a diet tribe. I mean, clearly, no, right? No, I it's like hated. This was so, this was like the universe getting back at me too. My mom was always giving me these whole grain breads and these like healthy things. Now we know that that's not a great idea, but like she was really health focused and I hated it. And I used to make fun of people who are gluten-free. It's like the California, like ditzy yeah. girl who is gluten-free, but like, that's not a real disorder. Um, and like, here I am now. Yeah. So no, I didn't want to be part of a diet tribe, but I feel like I was like prideful or something. And then the universe was like, ha, yeah. <laughs> here you go. For sure. <laughs> when it's, it's interesting, like once you're producing ketones, people tend to find that the cravings for alcohol 
tend to go away. That did. Yeah. So yeah, when I was in university and I was on, this is when I was still taking psych meds, I was extremely depressed. My diet changed when I went to university and I was eating like primarily dairy and grains, like pierogies and beer and pizza and Chinese food. Like, and it was delicious. And I felt terrible. And I gained weight when I first went to university. I didn't gain a lot of weight, but I gained weight pretty quickly. I think I gained 20 pounds in the first year. And I was like, what, like what's going on? And it turned out it was from my diet. Um, so that was unpleasant. I think when uh, you're producing ketones, I don't know, you know who Dr. Chris Palmer is? Ah, uh, yeah, I love him. Yeah, it's, uh, have you heard him talk about the sort of mitochondrial dysfunction and alcohol and how that works? No, ethanol. I haven't. And when I had him on my channel, it was wild. So he, he explains that when you are mitochondrially dysfunctional or metabolically dysfunctional, kind of two terms that essentially go hand in hand, but in people that are alcoholics, people that really feel like they need alcohol to function, what they found is that ketones enter the mitochondria in a similar fashion to how alcohol or ethanol will enter the mitochondria. Wow. So when you consume something like even a ketogenic beverage, something that has like a high level of BHB or you put them in nutritional ketosis, they're essentially satisfying this metabolic insufficiency that they would normally satisfy when they have alcohol. So you know how there's these people that are quote unquote functioning alcoholics, like they don't feel normal until they have alcohol. When they are producing ketones or even take exogenous ketones, it satisfies that same quote unquote itch that they would get from drinking alcohol. That's fascinating. Yeah, so okay. Cause like, well, like I was saying in university, I drank a lot and I know a lot of people drink a lot in university, but the reason I drank a lot was because I was in hell when I wasn't drinking. Like I had chronic fatigue. I was miserably depressed. I could barely control my thoughts. And when I drank, I calmed down and I was like, I can have a conversation now. And so I drank too much and mixing alcohol with psychiatric medications is not a good idea, but I felt normal drinking. And when I went onto the paleo diet, that definitely changed. Like a couple of things changed. I was on Adderall too for chronic fatigue and my response to Adderall changed. So instead of being like, I, I never liked it, but instead of being like, I'm awake, I have energy, I kind of got numb and my sense of humor got dampened and I, I got like uncomfortable. It was like, oh, okay, so stop the Adderall because that, that's not a good response. My uh, response to psychiatric medications changed when I went on, it was like a keto paleo diet, like I said, um, and the antidepressants like stopped working. My dad had the same experience. Um, and I definitely reduced my alcohol consumption. So I will drink a bit now, but I hardly ever drink. Like I hardly ever drink. If friends come over once a month, plus I just had a baby, it's probably once a month and I don't drink the same amount as I used to drink. That's interesting though. I hadn't heard of that because I really did feel normal drinking. Did you, uh, do you notice now that you need less alcohol to get a buzz? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, as soon as I cut out carbs, the hangover was worse. I think because the first couple of times I drank, I drank the same amount as I used to drink when I was drinking carbs yeah. or eating carbs and it was a disaster. So yes, very small amounts, pretty severe hangover. So yes. it's very rare. Yeah, there's, I mean, it would make sense. I mean, if you could kind of have to theorize here, but if you visualize it or illustrate it as, let's say the mitochondria is not getting the amount of energy that, or it's not producing the amount of energy mm -hmm. that it needs, right? But if alcohol allows that mitochondria to, in the brain, to at least function normally. That's then crazy. I can't believe I haven't heard of this. If you're plugging that in with ketones versus alcohol, yeah. then when you do have alcohol on top of that, you're already there. You don't need to. So for example, if your mitochondria was like a sink and you needed to have alcohol just to get that mitochondria to like fill up to a normal, and this is completely scientifically inaccurate. I'm just illustrating a point to fill up to a specific point, right? Well, then you would need more alcohol above and beyond that to actually get sort of the time dilation, all the other effects that would come with alcohol and the, the, you know, any euphoric feelings or any sort of impairment, right? So you need, this is just gets me to baseline. I'm a functioning alcoholic. I need this much to get to here. So then I have to drink above and beyond that. If you are already here because your body's producing ketones, it would make sense that you'd only need this much alcohol to feel it versus having to fill this bucket and then tip over your bucket's already filled and now you're just tipping over. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. No, it does. This reminds me too. So my brother, who's like the healthy one in our family, when he drank, when, when we were younger, he'd get tired. 
Like he'd, he'd have some drinks and he'd get tired. And when I drank, I'd get energized, like awake, yep. finally awake. And when I cut out all the carbs and went to this paleo diet, and it's even more intense on like just eating meat, um, I got tired when I drank. And I was like, is that the normal response to alcohol? I had no idea why. It was just like, it's not the same. It's like what happened with Adderall and what happened with psych meds is like they changed. So that's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. I'll send you okay. the clip on Thank that you one. for it's that. super interesting. It was, uh, it's mind blowing. And he's, you know, he's not someone that's just like a fly by night random you know, psychiatrist, like no. Chris Palmer is, I mean, he is a teaching instructor, like actually trains the professors at Harvard, which, I mean, he's definitely got some serious clout behind him. And, you know, I know people have what they have to say about Harvard and this guy kind of opposes the general view of what people would think Harvard is all about. So the fact that he has credibility in a university where a lot of people don't really take what they say seriously anymore, it sort of satisfies both sides. It's yeah. like, okay, this guy makes sense to this community and to this community, something he's saying is accurate. But with, with ketones, it's so interesting because like with what someone does on a traditional ketosis diet or ketogenic diet versus say what you're doing, I think some people, when they start just straight up ketosis, like whether they're, you know, let's say they're not doing carnivore, they get this influx of ketones, which has a, you know, neuro uh, or anti -neuro, neuro inflammation effect, right? So you're getting like that effect. And that probably allows them to feel X amount better. But when you take it a step further and go the route you're going, you're also adding the elimination aspect of it. So like if you look at AIP, autoimmune paleo, you're removing a lot of things. So you're getting the benefit of elimination, but you're not getting the actual, I'm gonna go out on a limb and call it a healing effect of having ketones present, right? So you're only scratching mm -hmm. the surface. You're, you're eliminating with no potential for correcting or no potential for actually uh, having what's called a histone deacetylase inhibition where you can actually repair. I don't know if that makes sense. You're getting like one side, whereas with what you're doing, you're producing ketones and you're having elimination. So it makes sense that you're gonna feel significantly better than someone that is following just a standard ketogenic diet. Interesting, yeah. Well, like I, I mean, thank God I came across this because it was just, like I said, out of necessity. And I was just randomly cutting things. Like I knew, for some reason I knew when I ate meat I didn't seem to have arthritic reactions or any psychiatric reactions or like skin reactions. And so I got to a certain point where I was like, well, I know meat's safe and it appears as if everything else is not safe. So I'll just do that for a while. So when I first got on it in December, 2017, my plan was to do it for six weeks and to start reintroducing foods. And so when my depression lifted, which was about six weeks in, and I still didn't feel that good, but I felt better and I wasn't crying in the morning, I tried to reintroduce olives and they were like, the organic olives that are only olives, like there's nothing like else in them. Just, just I, like love olives. Olives. Okay. <laughs> I love olives. I love olives. And it would like, it could have been pickles. I really like pickles too. But then there was the probiotic element and I was like, I just want like a food. No one's allergic to olives. Like everyone drinks olive oil or eats olive oil and everything. And I had a, like a horrible, like two and a half week long inflammatory reaction from eating these olives. And then that was enough for me to be like, okay, not that again. I'm just going to stick with this and see what happens. And then five months later, I was just like, like I said, I felt like I was in heaven. If there was one food that you could bring back into your diet. Cucumbers. Whether, really? That's, oh my gosh. Yeah. Cucumbers. Cause then you get pickles as well. I love cucumbers. Interesting. That's a one food. So, I mean, you could have chose ice cream. You could have chose like, like, no, like pickles, okay. pickles or cucumbers. All Ideally right. both. Yeah. So, if, and if there was one meat that you could add back into your diet, it definitely wouldn't be lamb, but... It'd be chicken wings. Okay. I like, I like chicken wings. And if I eat chicken and it's sourced from the right places, it's not too bad. It's not, it's not like, it's not like eating a plant food. I just don't feel very good. It's not very satiating. Like the diet kind of like sucked the yeah. joy out of chicken. I, I was going to ask you <laughs> if you notice a difference, like if you tried just eating chicken skin. Oh, I love chicken or skin. Or versus, because it's like... Sometimes it's, I mean, there's so much like methionine and so much in chicken breast and the actual meat of chicken. I'd be curious what would happen if you just ate chicken skin, just as like an experiment, but it's just because it's really just fat and you're not having nearly as much of the thiamine and these other things that might be kind of like throwing sort of the B vitamin scale off that kind of just be mm. interesting. I know a number of people that are really sensitive to, to chicken. And it was kind of funny, just as random to compare you to a dog. But <laughs> we had a dog that could not eat chicken. 
we could not like it, he would just start wheezing right it was like case in point right that like all creatures are going to have sensitivities to different foods we have to feed him a beef kibble if we feed him a chicken or a turkey or any poultry kibble he's got this horrible wretched wheeze and wow cough. and we're like trying to figure it out we spent thousands of dollars trying to figure out what's wrong with him doctors still don't know they put him on steroids and this and that 18 year old dog and then but the moment that we would just feed him beef or beef kibble that had nothing else in it but beef he was totally fine but I experimented and tried giving him, I'm gonna give him some chicken skin and kind of see what happens. And nothing happened with chicken skin, but if he had actual chicken, then he would wheeze. I totally would be speculating and pulling it out of the side of my mouth if I tried to say like, hey, it's because of this. But I'm just curious because the, the fat profile is so much different in chicken than it is in beef as well. That's interesting. Okay, I'm gonna try that because I like chicken skin. I think most of my reactions come from rather than some sort of imbalance after eating them, I think they come from an inflammatory, like almost allergic reaction to eating them. That's what it feels like anyway, it's fast. Yeah. Like you'd think if it was a disbalance in some way, it would take a number of days and it's usually like right after I eat it. And I'm like, uh oh, this didn't go well. And then it just continues to go downhill, but it's pretty fast. Yeah. Do you ever get like a like sort of congestion and like puffiness from it as far as yeah. itchy eye, almost like allergic type effects? Um, 100% not really with the itchy eyes, but yes, with a puffy face. My yeah. face just morphs when I eat certain foods. Yeah. Um, so puffy face, sometimes restricted breath, and sometimes an itchy mouth. So it does feel like an allergic reaction. Sometimes I don't get the itchy mouth. Like that happens with soy really badly. Um, and it's just like slow mental torture over a number of days. Totally. Well, Michaela, where can people hear look more about the Lion Diet, where they can find you, where they can watch you, et cetera? So I've got my main channel, which is Michaela Peterson. That's my podcast. Lion Diet information is on the Lion Diet on YouTube. And that like mostly caters to people who are severely chronically ill. Otherwise, I think you can get away with like keto or AIP or something like that. Um, and then liondiet.com has information for free, tons of recipes, how to get into the diet, how to wean out of the diet. Um, and my Instagram, which is Michaela Peterson. Perfect. Nice.